Does your organisation need more nurses? Struggling to connect with RNs where they spend time? Budgets are tight, there's a scarcity of applicants, and using travellers can cost up to an additional $150,000 per year. It's time for a superior solution. It's time to work with the experts. Like us. Since 2019, healthcare providers throughout the US and Canada have successfully engaged and recruited thousands of candidates using nurse recruitment experts' three-step advertising, screening, and consultative process. We help healthcare providers reach further with their advertising, discover hidden gems, and mobilize the power of their employer brand in nurse recruitment. With results-based pricing and no long-term commitments, we are the most cost-effective and low-risk partner for your nurse recruitment needs. So why not take your nurse recruitment to the experts? Visit nurserecruitmentx.com. Another webinar here at Nurse Recruitment Experts. I'm thrilled to be joined by Brandy Vines, who I spoke to a couple of weeks ago, and I enjoyed our conversation so much I wanted to bring her back on for a bit of a longer show. So I'm going to let Brandy introduce herself, and then we're going to jump into today's topic. So over to you, Brandy. Awesome. Well, Adam, thanks for having me on. So Brandy Vines, um, I have been in healthcare operations and staffing for um, about 22 years, and um, much of that being in leadership positions within large staffing companies here in the United States. Okay, great. And today, Brandy, we're going to talk over your nurse recruitment insights, get some analysis and expertise from you. I was wondering, could you give us a bit of background on your career so people can understand where you're going to be kind of getting your knowledge from? Yeah, no, of course. So um, within the 22 years that I've been in healthcare, the journey's kind of taken me in multiple different directions. Um, so started in um, pharmaceuticals. So CVS pharmacy manager, um, really learning the ropes of everything from billing, dealing with payers and um, different kind of drug indications. And um, that led its way into Pfizer pharmaceutical where I had a short stint there before actually um, transitioning over into AMN healthcare. I got to meet some uh, leaders in the Dallas AMN market. Um, so went to AMN staffing, um, ended up being a vice president there um, over, um, you know, a, a large production group there. Um, so then after a good stint at AM and Healthcare, I did some uh, support for cross country staffing, another large staffing company in the United States and helped them with their locums and advanced practice space and really get that business off the ground for them. And spent the last um, eight plus years with HCA Healthcare and Health Trust um, building about five different service lines, um, everything from travel nursing, interim leadership, locums, um, you name it, uh, within uh, the staffing space for the largest healthcare system in the nation. So um, now then I'm taking that experience and knowledge and doing some coaching and consulting and a couple of other things that I'm really excited about um, that I'll be announcing here pretty soon. Great, thank you so much. Uh, nurse recruitment experts, we're trying to bring on more experts and you've certainly across the kind of variety of roles and positions. It's interesting for me that you started out in staffing, then you worked for HCA to help them set up kind of their own staffing function. So mm -hmm. I'd love to ask a little bit about that because I've, I'm seeing it more and more in-house teams are creating their own contingent workforce management and planning that because they want to cut down on agencies. Do you have any tips for someone who is considering that or would like to set something like that up themselves? Yeah, I think it, it's really knowing your strengths and weaknesses as a healthcare system. Um, you know, at no healthcare system is the same and not even any one hospital is the same. So you can have this entire healthcare system and one particular hospital within your system has a completely different pain point than the other. So really knowing that first is the first goal because, you know, it's it can't be, in my opinion, a very cookie cutter approach because depending on what those pain points are will really help determine what your strategy needs to be to go about the appropriate staffing model. Um, but once you've discerned that, then it's really, you know, discerning the right partnerships. Um, for example, if you've got you know, your staffing is running really well for the most part at a particular hospital, but you're just really struggling in your OR. Well, then you need to figure out those right relationships to 
have that direct relationships with someone who can help in that arena. Um, you may have some other areas like, you know, I'm in the Dallas Fort Worth market and you have, you know, a hot, large metropolitan area, you may be better off with a more traditional VMS MSP support model because then you, you're looking at everything from med search telemetry and, you know, you're kind of mainstream house level positions within your staffing. So I think it just really depends on what's going on in your healthcare system. So that's the first step, discerning that. And then from there, doing the research and figuring out the right partnerships. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it seems to be working well for uh, HCA. And it seems like a concept that we could be seeing more of in the future. So it's, it's really interesting that you're one of the first to help set that up. I'd like to jump a little bit more into kind of general questions around nurse recruitment. So I was reading the Becker's Healthcare View, big healthcare industry news site. Mm -hmm. They asked about 91 executives, CNOs, CEOs, CFOs who are attending their upcoming conference. What are their top priorities? And I find a few points that are relevant to nurse staffing. The first one, one of the executives said they're focusing on building a pipeline of candidates through nursing schools. And I'm wondering if you have any advice or experience on how hospitals can do that better. Absolutely. So one of the things that I find very frequently with a lot of the hospital systems I've partnered with is they want to go out and talk to these nurses that are graduating and they start the, the relationship process their last year in school or last semester even. And they want to come have this relationship with them and convince them to come work for their hospital system, but they haven't invested the time since they enter nursing school to get to know them and what their focus um, and studies is. So the hospital systems I see do this the best from the time that person even says, I want to go to nursing school, they are keeping in touch with them for years throughout nursing school and really encouraging them through the process. So they're there already supporting them. Then even more important, making sure when they get ready for those clinical rotations, they're offering those clinical rotations at their facilities. So they're being able to come in and kind of track before you buy, right? It's like trying a shoe on to make sure it's the right fit. So more often than not, by the time a nurse is getting through their clinical rotations, if they're if a hospital's done a good job of really partnering with them, getting to know them throughout their entire tenure in nursing school, by the time they get to those clinical rotations and they're doing those clinical rotations in the hospital in which has been investing a relationship into that nurse, by the time they get to those clinical rotations, they get finished with the clinical rotation. They're like, okay, sign me up. As soon as I graduate, I'm coming here. Um, and so I think a lot of hospital systems that they're trying to tap into that pipeline of new grads coming out into the market, they're too late. They're coming into it that last semester or last year. And they, again, you have, you get what you put into something, right? And so I think that's where, you know, my observance is the hospital systems that do it the best. They're, they're with those nurses from the time that they even show interest at all in being a nurse. Um, and so that's a long sales cycle, right? You're talking, you know, you're talking years of investment, but um, you know, I think that's what, you know, nurses right now, they want, they want to know who's, who's, who really cares about me as a nurse and me being clinically, you know, a very competent, good nurse once I come out of school. Yeah. Building those long-term relationships sounds so vital for this. And when it comes to the, the school administrators, is there anything that health systems can do to partner with them or get, get them on, on side? Or do they have to kind of go for the, the relationships with the students themselves? No, I, I think you go directly to the administrators, from my experience, because even I you know, had a lot of really good relationships with administrators across colleges. And um, it they want their nurses to be supported. They don't want to, you know, every college doesn't matter what, you know, industry it is that the person's focusing on their, their schooling. They want to make sure when their students graduate that they immediately become successful and that they get a job and they're well employed. And, um, and so they have a vested interest. I think you'll find that, you know, a lot of, you know, college administrators are very much, you know, especially your admissions um, office, they, they want to partner with hospitals, even staffing companies, people that want to really make sure that those nurses are taken care of. Um, mm -hmm. 
one of the things that I worked a lot, you know, with the colleges that I partnered with was kind of painting this big picture of nursing for life. You know, when they come out, you know, do you want to be a, a, a staff nurse? Do you eventually five years from now want to travel? And do you want to be in leadership? And if you do, how do we start grooming and nurturing that from the time you step into the hospital clinically and start getting you in that mindset of grooming you for leadership? So painting this picture like, hey, mm-hmm. we're a one stop shop, you know, as a staffing agency. and want to come in and make sure your nurse, regardless of where they're at in their career, that they know that we can be there to support them along that journey. Right. OK. Yeah, that makes sense because the schools are going to be judged by success rate of their graduates absolutely i like that approach so when you touched upon staffing there another point i saw on the survey was Mm -hmm. managing a contingent workforce and some were mentioning how they wanted to find innovative approaches to doing it and then others were just talking about how do we cut down our spend on travelers Mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions or visions for the future of how health systems can better manage their contingent nursing workforce going into the next few years? Yeah, well, I think, you know, you and I talked about this briefly already about, you know, just tapping into your international nurses for your perm staff. That's the first thing, right? Like if you're looking at just a cut spend in its entirety, it goes back to pipelining, which is going to be your schools, um, you know, the walking billboards, your nurses and your patients, making sure you are doing a great job of recruiting through your nurse, your staff and your patients to have people come work there. Um, And then working on an international nursing strategy as well to get more nurses to um, your particular hospital. So that's the first thing. Um, I think doing a lot more local staffing um, versus um, true travel national staffing is it's more economical. Um, so if you can do, and a lot of that goes into some of the big tech players and, you know, where they've got really good um, technology to help with bridge that gap of the introduction of the nurse to the hospital in those local markets. That's not going to make sense for everybody. I mean, again, going back to the pain point of every hospital is different. That's going to work well for a hospital that's in a metropolitan area. If you're the hospital in Derry, New Hampshire, you know, that may not be the right strategy for you because there's not a plethora of nurses, you know, to build that local market. When you go to true national staffing, traditional travel nursing, um, one of the things, there are actually two different things that I would recommend. One, housing. The cost of living across the United States is getting so expensive. And a lot of nurses don't even want to do traveling anymore because by the time that they take that housing subsidy, and pay it towards whatever apartment or um, hotel that they're going to rent, it's not worth it financially for them to be on the road. So be a true partner with the staffing agencies you're working with. You're local. So if you're that hospital in Derry, New Hampshire, you know how to get more economical housing. You may have different options that you could offer up to whatever nurses are going to come to your market and actually reduce your bill rate. So instead of paying $85 an hour for a nurse, you may get away with a $70 an hour bill rate, but provide housing. Um, So then it becomes more lucrative for both the nurse and it becomes more financially affordable for the hospital system. Um, I've seen in some large markets, this also working well, where if you know as a hospital system that you're always gonna have 20, 30 contract labor nurses in the market, doing 12 month leases on apartments and having them ready to go. Because again, that that's the other problem with nursing nurses come in. If they want to have an apartment, um, they're going to have that surcharge on a short term lease. Whereas if a hospital already has a 12 month contract out on a lease, it reduces the cost per month. And so that's a, you know, a a way that they can um, absolutely come alongside again, being a partner. I keep using the word a lot partner because I feel like to a large degree, you know, with hospital systems and staffing, there hasn't been a lot of strategy throughout the pandemic. So it's being more strategic right now and figuring out how we, you know, can partner equally staffing companies and hospital systems to figure out how to reduce those costs. The other thing, Adam, that I have seen a lot of as of late, um, is this kind of, we're still in this whack-a-mole approach of staffing. So what I mean by that is we'll offer a nurse a 13-week contract in the United States. And the second that we see on the PL that we need to cut costs, we cancel that nurse. Well, maybe that nurse was only there for four weeks. Okay, 
just like an HR hat, when you think about your the cost of onboarding for perm staff, it's no different with contract labor. If you get a nurse in for four weeks, what did you really get out of that expense? By the time they got up to speed, oriented to the hospital, really know, like hopefully they already know your EMR, but even if they already know your EMR, do they know your hospital? It's, it's something totally different than just your EMR. So my recommendation is taking a step back and stop thinking short-sighted, think more long-term. If you're doing a forecast and you know, I'm 10 FTE short in this department, you're not going to have 10 new, new perm staff nurse, nurse, nurses in the next you know month, right? Um, unless you have just this awesome recruiting strategy. So you're better to take uh, two, three, whatever the right number is, and potentially even do longer contracts. Have nurses come in, but do a six month contract so that there's not this retraining. You get a higher level of productivity out of the nurse that you're bringing in because they're more bought into the healthcare system and you're not doing this cycling. You know, I, the amount of times I've seen a hospital system bring in four travel nurses, cut the four travel nurses, then three weeks later, guess what? They're ordering four more travel nurses. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing this like back and forth and that doesn't help. It also impacts your, your staff morale because you have this constant cycling um, you know, staff where they don't know the fellow nurse that they're handing off their patients to. Um, then also your, your patient satisfaction. Your patients, you know, sometimes your nurse, your patients are in the hospital for weeks. And if you have this constant cycle of staff, you don't have that patient you know, care continuity that can also be of concern. So that's the other recommendation is, you know, thinking more long term, doing that predictive analytics to look forward to figure out what your census is going to be, comparing that to your core staff and what you're short so you can do a better job of forecasting what you're really going to need in contract labor and having a more committed model to it because it will increase your productivity. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like what you're describing, plugging holes and then just managing things off a spreadsheet instead of considering the longer term outcomes for patients or the organization as a whole. Right. Whenever you, you mention longer term contracts, then how how could systems best promote those would that be through staffing providers would they would they would say here we have a six month contract instead of the standard 13 weeks or would that be direct with nurses yeah i mean i think that's them going to the the staffing agencies that they work with and, and even trying to be like hey like if we're doing a more committed model can we get a reduction in the bill rate right like in doing that partnership it's a yin and yang right you got it you make sure that you're you know partnering together you, you see that a lot through you know seasonality with hospital systems where they will forecast for flu season now you know now we're going to have a covid season i don't know if that's going to become a thing but it seems to be just continuous but um but you know looking at your year over year quarter over quarter figuring out what the the census is really looking like in your hospitals and again not thinking short-sighted to the PL this month, thinking of you know what that long-term play is going to look like realistically within each department, um, and then making a determination off of that. But yeah, I think it can absolutely be partnering with staffing agencies that you already know and trust. It's just you know saying, hey, here's what we're thinking. Instead of ordering six travel nurses right this second, we're going to do mm -hmm. three. But I'd rather do three for six months. Let's get them in here. Let's get them part of you know our system and make them you know kind of bought in and, and make sure that there are three nurses that will come in and like I said, mention really jump in and increase the productivity and delivery to the patient care. If you've been excited or interested in what Brandy just said, if you're a podcast listener, her name is Brandy Vines. You can find her on LinkedIn because I think that you could. You could bring a lot of value to organizations that are really scratching their heads and how to best handle this. Before we move on, Derry, New Hampshire was where the first potato in the United States was planted. I know <laughs> that because the settlers were from Northern Ireland, where I'm from. There's a town here called Derry. I so, learned from you today. <laughs> yeah, no, I just get distracted by history things. <laughs> that's, my, uh, that's my background. So we're going to talk a little bit about retention now. So the the executives i read um they were saying we want to improve retention we want to manage your talent better through technology incentives uh, working patterns and also improve their engagement and get them committed to a shared sense of purpose and values and 
I think for a lot of people, this seems difficult to implement because it's not so tangible as mm -hmm. offering increased wage or sign on bonus. You know, it's trying to get people to sign up to a common worldview and a sense of purpose. So I'd love to hear how you see that potentially happening and any experiences you've had in the past of, of making it happen. Yeah. I, the first step is starting, right? You, I think a lot of people talk about retention and, and trying to increase morale in your staff, but they never actually launch something. There's a committee for a committee to a committee for nothing to happen. <laughs> so, you know, the, the first step of starting is doing the assessment. You have to be open to real, raw, candid feedback. Um, you know, I tell everybody, even your your biggest critic, you know, someone who, you know, maybe even your arch enemy, if it's someone that you don't, that gives you feedback, even their feedback, you've got to take that step back and figure out, okay, what morsel little nugget of this has validity to how we can improve the way that we go about supporting our staff. So going back to your feedback, you know, most hospitals, they do have employee engagement surveys or something of that nature. But I would, I would question, you know, every HR leader in our, in our hospital systems, how effective are those employee engagement surveys? Are they actually getting to the core of what the issues are? I think most often, you know, they're not, those employee engagement surveys, they're pretty superficial. Um, and a lot of times the questions, at least from what I've seen in multiple hospital systems, they're not very targeted. So the questions are, they can be ambiguous to where when you get the feedback, you can't really dissect it to figure out what the real problem is. Um, you know, I encourage unit directors, sit down, survey monkey. You can get on survey, make it create a, a survey in 10 seconds and make it very targeted to what it is that you need to know as a unit leader as far as what the true issues are. So that's the first step. You've got to figure out what the issues are. Um, you know, I think you're going to hear a lot of staffing. You know, a lot of the issues are going to be staffing. We're overworked, productivity expectations. Um, you know, I go, I come to a unit. I, I'm concerned for my license. You know, I've got too many patients and I'm got an elopement risk over here and, a, and another one who, you know, the patient's deteriorating and all of a sudden they're a higher acuity need to be transitioned to a higher acuity unit. Like it, it keeps coming at them. So I think that's going to be a large portion of what you hear. Um, but then you've got to take that whatever feedback that you get and you've got to come up with a strategy. You've got to come up with a plan to be truly supportive in those situations. Um, every hospital and healthcare staffing company um, for the most part, has some type of clinical leader involved. Um, you know, a lot of times in, the, in our in our staffing industry, it's your clinical liaison team. You have a CNO, clinical directors, somebody that's there for that clinical knowledge base. And then, of course, you know, just within your hospital, you've got your everybody from your clinical leaders within the unit all the way up to your CNO. And so the question is, is when they have those issues, what is the escalation process? To me, a lot of this comes back to communication. And so when you have that concern on a unit where you're understaffed or you're, you have a, again, like the example, I mean, that's real life. You could be a med tele nurse and all of a sudden, you know, a patient start deteriorating. Now you have a patient that immediately needs to go over to critical care. And what is that communication? What is the chain of events that needs to happen to say, raise the red flag? How do I get help right now so that I feel supported as a nurse? So I think coming up with communication processes for when a nurse gets into those situations where they feel uncomfortable with the current staffing situation um, is crucial right now for nurses to being heard. So when you start talking about retention, a lot of it's really, it, it boils down to starting getting the feedback. And then from when you get the fee feedback, start discerning what the process is going to look like to help, you know, fulfill those pain points. And again, communicating and being transparent, you know, coming back and say, hey, guys, you know, we surveyed this entire department. 80 percent of you said X, Y, Z. So we've heard you. This is where we're going to put our effort and focus right now. Um, the other thing on that, Adam, is a lot of times leaders, I, I'm guilty as charged. I've done this. We we see a problem and we think we know how to fix it. So we just go about fixing something and we roll out a new process or something um, to an entire group, but we never even got the feedback of the people who said this is the problem. So I encourage any clinical leader within a unit, you know, CNOs, et cetera, 
even your HR channels, incorporate your staff into those decisions. Because even if they say 80% say that this is the problem, you may come up with a solution that to the 80% that said that that's a problem, it may not really resonate with what they think is going to fix the issue. Um, so make sure that, you know, and I hate to use the word committee, but you need a committee. You need to pull your staff level nurse that are saying that this is the problem, pull them into the solution. I think you'll be surprised with how many amazing ideas that they actually bring to the table. Um, Cause Generally speaking, I think people, you know, want to have a good working environment. People don't like to come into to work and, and hate their job. Um, so I think if you pull them into that process, you can really get some buy in um, from each staff level nurse to be part of the solution. We, instead, because right now what I hear a lot of is just I hate to say it, but grumbling. Right. There's a lot of nurses grumbling versus being pulled into part of the solution. Yeah. And that's that's fine and it's natural for them, I think, to behave like that if there's no opportunity for yeah. them to feel a part of it. Absolutely. So I think what on our end is we're focusing on the recruitment of talent. And we see that as well. So yeah. we make sure anyone who goes for an interview, we get feedback from them and ask them how they viewed the process and mm -hmm. what could be improved about it. So when it comes to recruiting nurses, I think doing this at every step of the way, recruitment, retention, before they leave, after they leave, yeah. is the most important thing to listen to rather than coming up with ideas yourselves in, in a closed office. Well, and Adam, I'm going to go back to like clinical liaisons on the staffing side. There's a lot of staffing companies that do have clinical liaison clinical departments that help support the contract labor nurses as they're out there. But to a large degree, it's more risk mitigation. And, you know, they're there to help, you know, if something goes wrong. Whereas I feel like where staffing companies can kind of raise the bar is really making sure that those clinical liaisons are their partners. So I'm going to go back to those examples where a nurse calls their recruiter, says, I'm canceling contract. I'm walking out right now. This place is a disaster. There's not no support. Instead of just calling it quits. Again, I'm going to go back to the cost of orienting any nurse, regardless if they're contract labor or a perm nurse, there's a cost associated with that. So what can you do to salvage that contract? So at that point in time, having your clinical liaisons really have a strong partnership with, with whatever clinical leaders are at that hospital to really say, okay, hey, here's what the nurse is saying. Like, let's work through this. What's something we can do to help provide this nurse more support in this area to make sure we can salvage this contract and relationship versus having to start over. Because if that nurse walks out, that's what you're doing. You're going to start over by figuring out what either another travel nurse or perm nurse is going to come in there to backfill that nurse walking out. Um, so again, going back to the retention, I think that's where, you know, a lot to a large degree staffing agencies can elevate the game is, you know, really challenging their clinical teams that they have um, to be a more part of the solution of retention. Yeah. Okay. And I know we're short on time. So if anybody wants to get in touch with you to talk about that a little bit more or any of the other topics you've covered, how can they reach you? Yeah. So um, I live on LinkedIn. You can always, you know, uh, message me on LinkedIn or, um, you know, equally email me. We have our new website, the Covalent Culture. It's covalentculture.com. Um, and so that's where you can also reach out. I do a lot of, again, coaching and consulting right now. And if you want to schedule any time for any further conversations, I do offer a free consultation. Um, if you can go on the website, you can offer that free, um, sign up for that free consultation and we can figure out how it could be of help. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brandy. And uh, again, I'd encourage anyone who wants to have a chat with Brandy, reach out to her. Uh, she's, she's a real expert in this field and can share a lot of knowledge with you. So appreciate you coming on, Brandy. And tune in to our upcoming podcasts and webinars. We've got a few a few great uh, guests lined up. You can just follow Nurse Recruitment Experts on LinkedIn to see our upcoming events when they're launched. And if you want to learn more about what we do, search nurserecruitmentx.com. We are offering a free trial where you get three nurses for free uh, so we can show you how we can amplify your nurse recruitment so that's all for this week thank you so much brandy and uh, we'll hopefully talk to you soon bye awesome.
Thanks, Adam. Bye. Cheerio.